It's the opening king bomb of 2023, and the show has dominated the entire US TV series charts. The series has garnered unprecedented acclaim, adapted from the popular game The Last of Us. The cause of the virus is a common fungus called cordyceps, which is capable of hosting itself in the human body and manipulating the human mind. The story takes place one night, the booming noise from outside roused Sarah from her sleep. She immediately got up to investigate, but Joel, her father, was nowhere to be found. The television is broadcasting urgent news of emergency actions. Just then, the neighbor's dog rushes to the door, as if seeking help from Sarah. Quickly, Sarah opens the door to check the situation. The dog seems to be frightened by something. As soon as Sarah steps outside, the dog starts barking loudly, curious. Sarah enters the neighbor's house, only to find bloodstains all over the floor, almost slipping. Then Sarah sees the old grandfather lying on the ground, barely conscious. Just as Sarah is about to approach to check, she notices the long paralyzed old grandmother feasting. When the old grandmother looks up, her mouth is full of moving, unidentifiable creatures. The old grandmother slowly stands up and suddenly lunges at Sarah with ferocity. Reacting quickly, Sarah turns and runs. At this moment, Sarah's father and uncle arrive. The grandmother who chased them out fell to the ground and didn't move, but quickly got back up, then lunged at them frantically. Finally the grandmother was knocked down by Joel's spanner. They immediately got into the car and prepared to leave the city, and the infected on the road rushed towards the car. Just as Sarah was puzzled, Joel explained to Sarah that this was a common cordyceps fungus, causing infections mostly among city dwellers. At this moment, someone on the roadside waves for help. Tommy was initially going to stop and help, but Joel stopped him, ignoring whatever Sarah tried to persuade him. Perhaps this is the correct way to survive in the apocalypse. As they come to a highway junction, they find it blocked off. They have no choice but to take a detour. Soon, they arrive back in the city. The streets are in chaos, with people running in all directions in panic. Infected individuals are viciously attacking pedestrians, with more and more people infected. Traffic quickly grinds to a halt. They attempt to drive through, but a multitude of infected individuals emerge ahead. They were desperately trying to back up only to be faced with the same situation again. There are just too many of them. Soon, their car is surrounded on all sides, just when they didn't know what to do. This scene appeared in the sky. When they wake from unconsciousness, the car is overturned, and outside, infected individuals are feasting on bodies. Sarah has also sustained a sprained ankle. Suddenly, a police car crashes into the intersection and Tommy is injured. Tommy instructs Joel to take Sarah and go, planning to meet by the river on the opposite side. In a dire situation, Joel holds his daughter tightly and dashes forward. They navigate through alleyways to reach an intersection, only to witness a chilling scene. One of the infected individuals spots them. Joel quickly rushes into a house. The nimble infected individual chases them relentlessly. Joel carries his daughter through the house and out into the open, just as the infected were about to catch up with them. Suddenly the infected were knocked down by a single shot. The shooter is a heavily armed soldier. After contacting headquarters for instructions, the soldier not only refrains from offering assistance but approaches with his gun raised. Despite Joel's desperate pleas that they are not infected, the soldier pulls the trigger. Fortunately, Joel narrowly avoids the shot, but the soldier aims his gun at Joel again. In a crucial moment, Tommy arrives in the nick of time. Joel suffers only minor abrasions. Sarah, however, is not as fortunate. Struck in a vital area, she collapses to the ground. Watching his daughter's anguished expression, Joel's heart aches beyond words. He wishes it were him lying there. Tommy stands helpless at a distance. In the end, Sarah closes her eyes forever in her father's arms. Twenty years later, this place had turned into a wasteland. Survivors could only huddle within concrete walls, barely scraping by. But rules inside were incredibly strict. Anyone entering or exiting the quarantine zone without authorization would face a death sentence. Every day, Joel eked out a living through various dirty and exhausting tasks. Yet, he also engaged in clandestine smuggling to make ends meet. Meanwhile, Tommy mainly ventured out to scavenge for supplies, but he hadn't returned for three weeks. Joel is so worried about his brother that he buys a junk car from a soldier, but he needs a battery to start it. Joel sends his new wife, Tess, to buy it on the black market. Unexpectedly, the dealer did not keep his word and took their money and sold the battery to someone else. The merchant, fearing Joel's retaliation, hoped Tess would let bygones be bygones. Before they could sort things out, an unexpected bombing rocked their house, providing the merchant with an opportunity to escape. 
The area was caught in crossfire between regular troops and rebels. When Joel saw his wife back home, he was furious. However, Tess urged him to remain calm. In the face of scarcity, retrieving the battery was the most crucial task at hand. They spent some money to learn who had bought the battery. Tess and Joel soon arrived at the buyer's home, only to be shocked by what they saw. They pressed forward, encountering a blocked door with copious amounts of blood seeping from underneath. Tess slams the door open, and the passageway is filled with bodies. Among them was the merchant's lifeless body. The battery Joel and Tess were seeking lay discarded nearby. Tess discovered that the battery was defective. Businessman makes money from a bad battery. At that moment, there was a sound coming from the side of the passage. Joel cautiously approached and found living people. As Joel slowly advanced towards them, a girl suddenly bolted out of the room. Before Joel could comprehend the situation, he heard someone calling his name, his old friend Marlene. Marlene was the leader of a rebel faction, and her repeated attempts to recruit Joel had been met with resolute rejection. They had also come for the battery. Their primary goal was to get the girl, Ellie, out of the quarantine zone, and with all the commotion, the army will be here soon. Injured. Marlene had no choice but to entrust Ellie to Joel's care. Marlene promised that if they safely delivered Ellie to the rebel base, her people would provide Joel with what he needed. After a brief discussion, Tess and Joel reluctantly agreed to the deal. Night fell, and they navigated through the sewers to reach the heavily guarded exterior wall. The next step was to circumvent the buffer zone from the left side. They cautiously evaded patrols and used dilapidated buildings as cover, finally reaching the outskirts of the quarantine zone. However, what they didn't expect was a soldier on patrol relieving himself at that very moment. To avoid gunfire, they raised their hands, surrendering themselves. Tess and Joel attempted to bribe the soldier with various offers, yet the soldier remained steadfast. Using a fungus detection device to check whether the three were infected. When Ellie was scanned, she suddenly used a knife to stab the soldier's leg. This action only further enraged the soldier. As the soldier aimed his gun at Ellie, Joel swiftly interposed himself. The soldier repeatedly yelled for them to move aside. A voice that triggered a familiar memory in Joel. Joel tackled the soldier to the ground, unleashing years of suppressed anger, ultimately killing the soldier. On the side, Ellie watches in astonishment. Before Joel could regain his composure, Tess noticed that the detection device had turned red. Ellie's hands bore traces of infection. However, now was not the time to dwell on this issue. They had already alerted the patrol, and their immediate priority was to escape. They managed to slip through a chain-link fence and finally made it outside. Their adventure had officially begun. The next day, they confirmed Ellie's immunity to the virus and continued escorting her. It's a post-apocalyptic vision of the fungus virus that has swept through the city, leaving everything as it was 20 years ago when the fungus broke out. Most cities had suffered similar bombings. Their destination was now within close reach. A mere 10-minute walk through the ruins would take them there, however, the ruins were infested with groups of infected, leading to a dead end. For safety, they decided to take a longer route to proceed. They reached a hotel balcony. Looking down, Ellie saw the streets below teeming with infected. Clearly, they couldn't proceed along this path. They had to change their plans and find a way around the infected to reach the museum. Soon, they arrived at the museum entrance, the fungus having spread beyond its walls. Apart from the bodies already covered in fungus, Ellie spotted a recently deceased human. However, it seemed this wasn't the work of the infected. It was evident that terrifying creatures lurked within the building. They cautiously ascended the stairs, the floor littered with desiccated corpses. Joel gestured for Ellie to remain silent, as the infected had keen hearing. But usually, the more you fear something, the more likely it is to happen. With no time to think, they quickly sought refuge in a nearby room. As soon as they walked in, the stairs outside collapsed and their way out was blocked. Strange noises emanated from the corridor. A peculiar infected creature was closing in on them. They retreated cautiously, but another one emerged from behind. These are clickers, who have lost their eyesight but possess heightened hearing sensitivity. And they hid behind a cupboard, afraid to make a sound. But Ellie was too nervous to see a monster for the first time. And even the slightest movement will be caught by the clickers. A fierce battle ensued. Joel blocks the pouncing clickers. Another clicker attacked Tess and Ellie. Tess quickly pulls Ellie to escape, but they fall on the way. Seeing that the clickers behind her are about to catch up, Tess shoots and attracts the clickers so Ellie can escape. Meanwhile, Joel was pursued by clickers. He toppled a statue and took cover. The noise from the fallen statue momentarily disrupted the clicker's pursuit. As Joel prepared to reload, he realized a clicker had silently approached. Luckily, he went unnoticed. However, 
The clicker moved toward Ellie. Joel hurriedly joined Ellie, signaling her to move towards him. Unintentionally, he stepped on glass shard, alerting nearby clickers. The clickers heard the sound and immediately jumped at Joel. In the midst of chaos, Joel fires his gun, fending off the clickers, then shoots at their heads until he exhausts all his bullets. But Joel forgot about one last clicker. Just in the nick of time, Tess burst onto the scene. Joel swiftly grabbed a fallen submachine gun, firing at the clicker's head. Finally, the crisis was averted. At this moment, the view from the rooftop is very beautiful. They had crossed the danger zone, and the open streets ahead offered a pleasant view. Upon arriving at their destination, they discovered that everyone inside had perished. Ellie revealed that Marlene had instructed her to head west. Joel felt something was wrong and tried to talk Tess into going back. However, Tess revealed that her time was running out. She had been bitten by a clicker at the museum. Tess couldn't accompany Joel any further. She hoped Joel would take Ellie to the west, to the hands of the researchers. Who knows, they might be able to develop a vaccine and save the world. At that moment, the infected on the ground came to life. Joel decisively shot him in the head, but they didn't realize that it had triggered the fungus underground. Nearby infected also received the message of Wormwood. They began to rise up from the ground, and then attacked Joel in his place. Time was running out. Tess made a quick decision. She knocked over a nearby gasoline canister and spilled a pile of ammunition. She would stay behind to hold them off. Although Joel's heart is not willing to let go, but also understand Tess's meaning. He can only endure the pain and pull Ellie to leave. Soon, the infected broke through the door. Tess appeared flustered. Not many people could remain composed in the face of death. In her final moments, Tess dropped her lighter. All the infected inside the building were eradicated. As they looked at the destroyed building, Joel and Ellie knew that Tess had traded her life for their chance to escape. This moment also marked a swift transformation for the once mischievous Ellie, who instantly matured. For Ellie, born in the midst of this post-apocalyptic world, her curiosity was piqued about the origins of the fungal infection. Joel shared with her the story of what happened, 20 years ago, on a certain day. A parasitic fungus that typically attached to animals underwent a mutation, it latched onto wheat and flour. As the townsfolk consumed these infected products, they began to transform. Within a week of the fungal outbreak, the government evacuated the remaining survivors. The only exception is Bearded Bill, who was still holed up in the basement waiting. After everyone had left, Bill emerged from his shelter, sporting a contented expression. The entire town was now deserted, leaving Bill alone, a satisfied smile on his face. But now is not the time to rest. Bill drove the van and pulled the yacht to the petrol station, taking advantage of the electricity not being cut off yet. He quickly fills all the fuel barrels. Then, Bill heads to a large supermarket and begins a frenzy of purchasing various everyday necessities. Next stop is the natural gas plant. He then brings home steaks and wine. The next step is to establish defensive fortifications. Bill starts by using the power grid to enclose several nearby houses. Then, he proceeds to set up traps to prevent infected from infiltrating the area. And finally, you gather food, start a small vegetable garden, build a chicken farm, and build a cold storage facility for meat. And so a paradise was born. Bill enjoyed his life alone, and his greatest pleasure was watching the infected fall into the traps. Until one day, four years later, Bill was polishing his gear in the warehouse when alarm after alarm went off. Bill cautiously approached the source of the noise and found a man ensnared in one of his traps. After confirming the man was unarmed, Bill let down a ladder and used an infection tester to verify if he was contaminated. Green indicated the absence of fungal infection. Bill urged the man to get out of there immediately, but the man, Frank, said he was very hungry and hoped that Bill could let him eat before leaving. Bill could only take him back home. Frank's unexpected visit exposed him to the unexpected comfort and luxury of Bill's life. Red wine and steak were rare delicacies in this post-apocalyptic world. After the meal, Frank obviously didn't want to leave. Although he promised to leave immediately, he kept finding excuses to stall for time. Frank saw an antique piano and sang as he played. Bill played and sang with the same emotion, and they fell in love at first sight. After all, even if you're comfortable living alone, you will always be lonely, and so they lived together for three years. Joel and Tess came here by chance. They had their own needs and set up a trading chain. It's not easy to make real friends in a post-apocalyptic world. Another three years later, on a rainy night, a group of uninvited guests broke into the town. While fire and electric fences repelled the invaders, Bill sustained an abdominal injury. Frank, however, intervened just in time to rescue him. Another decade rolled by. 
Frank is in a wheelchair, watching Bill come out of the kitchen was just like when they first met. Same steak and wine, however, what's different now is that they have aged into elderly individuals, they're getting tired of living like this, and it's Frank who wants to end it all, because he's suffering from cancer every day. In the end, they dress neatly, and they lovingly place wedding rings on each other's fingers, with the sunset as their witness, they peacefully bring their lives to an end together. Fast forward to today, Joel and Ellie had also arrived in a small town. What was once a vibrant home now lay covered in yellowing leaves. When they entered the house, they found dust everywhere, a letter and a key on the table. The letter said that they were gone and that Joel could use whatever was left here. Use it to protect the people you need to protect. These words struck a chord with Joel, reminding him of Tess and bringing a heavy sadness to his heart. Back in the day, the four of them had enjoyed feasts together in this very place. Now, only he remained, living a solitary existence. After some preparation, Joel and Ellie took a hot shower, changed into fresh clothes, and ventured forth into the unknown world. In this post-apocalyptic reality, the most formidable threat often came from human hearts rather than monsters. Before them, an injured man cried for help. However, such tactics had little chance against Joel's seasoned judgment. With a swift motion, Joel fastened his seatbelt, floored the gas pedal, and rammed into the man. The car's windshield shattered as a rock struck, and a professional roadblocking gang revealed itself. The vehicle eventually lost control and came to a halt against a laundromat. Without hesitation, Joel led Ellie out of the car. The firepower outside was too fierce. Joel pointed to the opening in the wall gesturing for Ellie to wait for him to counterattack and she would climb in. As soon as the words left his mouth, Joel sprang into action. Ellie seized the opportunity and quickly entered the room through the opening. Joel swiftly engaged the assailants, taking down one with practiced ease. However, another man charged at him. Meanwhile, Ellie stared at the barrel of the gun in the hole in the wall and froze. A gunshot rang out, and Joel neutralized the remaining assailant. Before he could catch his breath, Another enemy emerged from behind him. Although Joel knocked away the gun, he was also instantly restrained by the other man. Joel was so overwhelmed that he couldn't even catch his breath. Ellie suddenly appeared and shot the man in the leg. Saving Joel, the man desperately begged for his life. Fear of death is in everyone's heart. However, Joel had no intention of letting him go. Joel didn't want Ellie to see his cruelty, so Ellie hid behind the wall. The man was finally shot by Joel. What Joel didn't realize was that the man was the son of Kathleen, the leader of the local marauders. Soon the armed men were out in force, searching every room in the city. What they didn't know was that Joel and Ellie were hiding in a corner they hadn't noticed. Taking advantage of the commotion outside, Joel taught Ellie how to use a firearm when there was no more noise. Joel and Ellie went to the upper floors of the building and found a clean place to rest for the night. Joel even laid broken glass in the doorway before sleeping. In case someone attacked them while they were sleeping, Joel and Ellie fell into a deep sleep. I don't know how long it took, but Joel heard Ellie's urgent call, opening his eyes. Joel was met with the cold barrel of a gun pointed at him. It turned out that Henry and Sam were bitter enemies of Kathleen, they had been hiding in an attic, barely surviving, and happened to witness Joel eliminate the attackers. This led Henry to take the risk of approaching Joel, hoping that he could help them escape the city. Henry and Sam were aware of a shortcut for escape. Henry guided them through the city's sewers and led them to the outskirts of the city. All that remained was to cross a small bridge ahead to completely escape Kathleen's grasp. But what they didn't realize was that there was a sniper on the bridge. Joel told them to hide here and he went round alone to try and take care of the other side. But when Joel pushes open the door, he finds an old man with gray hair, initially reluctant to resort to violence. Joel asked the man to surrender his weapon and leave peacefully. However, the man stubbornly resisted, followed by a gunshot. Joel picks up the old man's sniper rifle. Kathleen's voice comes over the intercom. She tells the old man to hold Joel and the others back. She claimed they would arrive at the scene in just one minute. Joel immediately yells for Avery and the others to run, but it's obviously too late. Kathleen's men drove their vehicle straight towards them. As the vehicle was about to mercilessly crush Ellie, Joel managed to shoot the driver on the bulldozer, causing it to veer out of control and crash into a nearby store. A massive amount of gasoline began leaking, followed by a violent explosion. The explosion's debris and smoke obstructed Kathleen's pursuit. However, the smoke soon cleared, and they found themselves trapped. And the Joel on the attic is also outnumbered and helpless. To protect his brother and Ellie, Henry stepped up to provide an escape opportunity. Unforeseen by everyone, the bulldozer, on the brink of burning out, 
suddenly started sinking. The terrifying screams instantly echoed through the sky. They couldn't care less about Ellie and the others. They all gathered around the entrance of the cave. At that moment, thousands of infected came out of the underground cavern, and they were all scrambling to be the first to jump on the crowd. Even the frenzied fire from the crowd couldn't suppress the infected, and they were quickly overwhelmed. Wherever the infected passed, it was like wolves among sheep. Meanwhile, Ellie and her companions seized the opportunity to flee, but the scene was so chaotic that they were dispersed in no time. One of the zombies attempted to attack Ellie, but fortunately, Joel's gunshot from a distance provided cover just in time. Ellie swiftly took refuge in a nearby vehicle, quietly observing the hellish scene before her. Outside, Kathleen's military force was dwindling. At this moment, a huge mutant crawled out of the underground cave. It's not only powerful but also thick-skinned. Submachine guns have no effect on it. Kathleen's loyal bodyguard has his head snapped off. An infected person climbs into the car and Ellie flees the car in panic. Ellie saw Henry and Sam being attacked by the infected in the distance. She didn't hesitate to grab her dagger and rush over. Joel remained in the distance, providing cover, with a swift slash. Ellie dispatched one infected after another, successfully saving the brothers. Then, under Joel's protection, they made their escape. But Kathleen ran right into them, confronted with the pitch-black barrel of a gun. Ellie unexpectedly looked in a different direction. By the time Kathleen turned her head, the infected behind her pounced on her directly, and soon she was voiceless. Joel arrived just in time, swiftly leading Ellie and the others away from the chaos. They find an abandoned hotel where they can rest. However, Sam's mood was somber. It turned out that he had been bitten by an infected while under the car. To dispel Sam's fear, Ellie exposed her own previously bitten arm, falsely claiming her blood possessed healing properties. Without hesitation, Ellie cut open her palm and applied the fresh blood to Sam's leg. The next day, Ellie woke up to find Sam sitting motionless by the window. As she approached to check on him, Sam suddenly lunged at Ellie with a twisted grin. The commotion startled the others awake. Joel tries to come to Ellie's rescue, but Henry grabs his gun, knowing what Joel is about to do. Yet, seeing Ellie about to be bitten, Henry couldn't stand idly by. Ultimately, Henry fired the gun at his own brother. Now, with his only family member gone, he had lost his will to live. After burying the brothers, Joel and Ellie arrived near a river called the River of Death. As soon as they stepped out of the woods, they were surrounded by a group of cowboys with guns, and they released hounds that could tell if they were infected or not. The dog sniffed around Joel, confirming his safety, but Ellie's immune system is a carrier of the fungus, and as soon as the hound got close to Ellie, it pounced on her. The result is that one person and one dog are having a great time, turns out. The dog was just testing whether they were hostile. In the end, these people led Joel back to their settlement. It wasn't just heavily guarded, but also had thick wooden doors, akin to a hidden paradise. To Joel's surprise, his younger brother Tommy was also present there. After a long separation, the two of them embraced each other tightly. Overwhelmed with emotions, Tommy delivered good news to Joel, the woman next to him, Maria was his wife, but Joel didn't seem too happy about it. Since Tommy's disappearance, Joel had lived in constant fear, even losing Tess on the journey to find him. It's unexpected that Tommy had already found safety and happiness, yet he didn't send a radio message to inform Joel. Tommy explained that their settlement didn't allow the use of radios. Joel wants Tommy to take over and escort Ellie to the rebel camp. He feels that he is getting older. Earlier Joel was almost killed by a mob and it was Ellie who saved him by firing a shot. Tommy was accustomed to the peaceful life and his wife's pregnancy, making him reluctant to take risks. While Tommy eventually agreed to escort Ellie, Joel thought about his own daughter and didn't want Tommy's child to potentially lose a father. Thus, he left the decision to Ellie, without a doubt. Ellie chose Joel. Ellie and Joel mounted their horses, embarking once again on the journey to the rebel camp. This time, their progress was remarkably smooth, and they reached their destination quickly. However, the camp appeared long abandoned, with no signs of life and aggressive monkeys roaming the area. Despite the desolation, they managed to find a map detailing the locations of other rebel groups. As they were about to leave on horseback, they were suddenly ambushed by a marauder armed with a club. Joel backhanded the marauder and snapped his neck. But in the confusion Joel is stabbed in the stomach by the marauder. Now was not the time for treatment. As more marauders were closing in on them, they mounted their horses just in time. But the rough escape worsened Joel's injuries. Once they were far from the city, Joel could no longer hold on and fell from his horse. Joel's wounds were already bleeding profusely, and if they weren't treated, they could have been fatal. 
Faced with this dire situation, Ellie was at a loss. Ellie took Joel to a nearby abandoned house. In the midst of an apocalyptic world full of infected people, the chances of surviving a serious injury without medication are almost zero. Joel gently pushed Ellie away, urging her to leave and find Tommy at the river of death. But Ellie doesn't want to abandon Joel. After all, they'd been together for over three months. Joel had been a guardian to her, acting as a father figure, often putting himself in harm's way for her sake. Looking at such a stubborn Joel, Avery didn't say anything, she turned to leave. Joel's tears slipped from the corners of his eyes. Ellie was originally a socially awkward person and was always on her own at the regular army training camp. Due to her friend Riley's departure, Ellie became the target of her peers' bullying. Unfazed, she fought back, resulting in her confinement. It's the third time this month that Ellie has been locked up. In the dead of night, a mysterious figure entered through the window, startling Ellie, armed with a knife. Ellie prepared to defend herself, only to discover that the intruder was none other than her long-lost friend, Riley. Upon learning that Riley had secretly joined the rebel group, Ellie couldn't help but express her confusion. Riley promised to explain everything to Ellie but insisted on taking her somewhere first. They sneak out of the regular army's dormitory area and head to a shopping mall. This was a new experience for Ellie, as she had been born into quarantine and never encountered such places. She marveled at the escalators and even had fun on a carousel, but it's deep in the heart of the mall. So if there's any danger, they'll have a hard time escaping. But Riley opened the switch anyway. The sound is instantly heard throughout the mall and an infected person wakes up from a deep sleep in the distance. Ellie was fascinated by everything around her. They proceeded to a photo booth and took a series of snapshots. In the arcade, they played games that Ellie had never experienced before, and the happy diversion made them forget the dangers. However, happiness is often fleeting. Riley revealed that she was departing and that this was their final night together. Riley's purpose for this evening was to bid Ellie farewell. Being in opposing factions, there will inevitably come a day when they have to confront and possibly kill each other. But the bond of friendship wasn't so easily severed. Ellie was about to go back the way she came when she heard Riley screaming. Without hesitation, Ellie rushed back into the mall, following the sound to a toy store, only to discover that the scream had been a prank played by Riley. This was Riley's farewell joke before departing. They both came to terms with the reality of their situation. In the end, they playfully donned toy masks and danced on a store counter. Under the influence of alcohol, Ellie spilled her guts. Unexpectedly, a furious roar echoed from deep within the mall. Riley raised her gun, but clickers had already lunged at them. Despite her weaponry, Riley's marksmanship was lacking. All they could do was scurry away, but eventually they were pounced on by the clickers. Despite Ellie repeatedly stabbing the clickers in the waist, it proved ineffective, and she was eventually overpowered and knocked down by them. Riley's attempt to help only resulted in her being overwhelmed by the clickers as well, momentarily trapped in a dire situation. In that moment, Ellie finally erupted. She drove her blade straight into the clicker's head, while Ellie exulted in her triumph. Riley's expression turned somber. She had been bitten on the palm. Ellie, too, had been bitten on the arm. They sit on the ground and hate their fate. They were left with two choices, to end their lives swiftly or to wait for death's inevitable arrival. Riley insisted on the second option. Even if she was going to die sooner or later, it was never going to be now. And that's why Ellie survived. Because if it wasn't for Riley, she would have given up. Even though Joel urged Ellie to leave, she remained steadfast. Ellie continued to frantically search for something to treat their wounds. Finally, she stumbled upon a roll of sewing thread and a needle. Now, all that was left to do was to give it a try. Ellie carefully threaded the needle and stitched Joel's wound, one painstaking stitch after another. In the midst of Joel's convulsions of pain, Ellie rekindled Joel's hope of survival. In order to survive in the post-apocalyptic world, the first thing to do is to solve the problem of food. Ellie ventured into the forest with a hunting rifle, her determination set on finding food. After a prolonged search, she finally spotted a wild deer. With swift precision, Ellie raised her weapon, removed a glove from her hand, held her breath, and squeezed the trigger. However, the bullet didn't strike the deer's vital spot. Undeterred, Ellie followed the blood trail left by the wounded animal. What Ellie didn't realize was that the deer fell at the feet of two men. In a post-apocalyptic world where supplies are scarce, a deer is worth more than gold. Just as they were about to claim the deer, Ellie emerged, gun in hand. Surprisingly, the men didn't put up a fight. The man who called himself David spoke up and said that they were from a very large group with a lot of women and children who were all now extremely hungry. David proposed a trade of supplies for the deer, 
and considering Joel's dire condition, Ellie had the healing antibiotics in mind. David mentioned that the antibiotics were available back at their camp, but his companion James needed to retrieve them. In the meantime, David offered to go to a nearby cabin to wait. Ellie saw that David did not mean any harm and agreed. While he waited, at first, David tried to get Ellie on board, then David mentioned that he had sent four of his men out to gather supplies a few days ago. One of them was killed by a madman who ran off with a girl. Unmistakably, this madman was Joel. At that moment, James appeared behind Ellie, holding a gun. James had the chance to kill Ellie, but David was surprisingly lenient with Ellie, even letting James throw Ellie some pills. Without hesitation, Ellie grabbed the medicine and made a run for it. And curiously, David made no move to chase her. Although there is an anti-inflammatory medicine, but Ellie has no way to start, and finally directly put the needle in Joel's wound. I don't know if this is effective or not. The next day, David came to the door with his man. Swiftly, she returned to Joel's side. Wanting to flee with Joel, Ellie realized he was still too weak, barely coherent and struggling to even open his eyes. In a desperate attempt, Ellie placed a dagger in Joel's hand and then lured David's group away on her horse. She fired her gun to draw their attention, and just as they were about to give chase, David ordered his men not to harm Ellie. As Ellie's escape on the horse unfolded, James moved to end her life, but David intervened in the nick of time. And to make it even harder for everyone to understand, David carried Ellie back to camp himself, leaving only three of them to find Joel's revenge. They soon found the cabin where Joel was hiding, but Joel was gone. As the men searched meticulously, Joel, hidden in the shadows, swiftly took down one of them, but the danger wasn't over, two more men remained. Despite Joel's weakened state, he easily overpowered them. Before long, the men were subdued and bound. They were tortured by Joel to reveal the location of the marauder's camp. Ultimately, Joel put an end to them, for he understood the harsh survival laws of their chaotic world showing mercy to enemies was akin to being cruel to oneself. Meanwhile, Ellie wakes up in a cage and David, who is sitting outside the cage, immediately comes to talk to her. It turns out that in order to survive in the chaotic world, they eat human flesh. As the leader of the Marauders, David had kept this horrifying secret from the group. David's motive for bringing Ellie back was her inner strength. David tries to convince Ellie to join him, but Ellie's refusal eventually makes David angry and ready to drag her out of the cage. Ellie bites David on the hand. Losing patience, David dragged Ellie onto a table, ready to butcher her. In a desperate move, Ellie revealed her fungal infection, mentioning her bite on David's hand, which now meant he was infected as well. Though skeptical, the scar from Ellie's bite convinced David otherwise. Exploiting a distraction, Ellie seized a knife from nearby and plunged it into James' neck before sprinting for the exit, but the exits were locked. And Ellie, finding a piece of charcoal, hid behind a cabinet, waiting for her chance. David came after her with a knife. He easily dodged Ellie's charcoal. The charcoal ignited the curtains and the fire spread instantly. But David didn't care. Now David just wants to kill Ellie. Ellie uses her experience with Joel to find a weapon, and then attacks David from behind when he's not looking. Although he stabs David, Ellie is knocked to the ground by David. Ellie doesn't give up and crawls towards the weapon that has fallen in the distance. David kicked Ellie hard and then pressed Ellie ruthlessly underneath him, looking like he wanted to commit an animalistic act on Ellie. Just as David was about to undress, Ellie finally touched the weapon and sent David to hell with just one stroke. At this moment, Ellie's heart was full of fear. She had completely lost her mind. All the anger was also erupted. Looking at the white snow in front of her, Ellie didn't know where she should go from here. Just then Joel finally arrived. Ellie who had just faced the darkest aspects of human nature, struggled weakly, slowly regaining her senses. Ellie recognized the man before her and tears streamed down her face. Joel enveloped Ellie in a tight embrace. In the end, they supported each other as they ventured forward. Once they managed to escape the predicament, Joel and Ellie arrived near the rebel headquarters. Ellie was surprised to see a giraffe munching on a young leaf in the ruined city. One of the few happy moments for the post-apocalyptic Ellie. As Joel and Ellie continued their journey, a smoke bomb suddenly exploded behind them. Reacting swiftly, Joel shielded Ellie. The blast leaving them temporarily disoriented and deafened, Joel watched helplessly as Ellie was seized and, before he could react, a rifle but struck him down. When Joel regained consciousness, he found himself in a hospital room. It turns out to be Marlene, the rebel leader, who admires Joel's escorting abilities and also says that Joel can now leave. However, 
Joel relentlessly inquired about Ellie's whereabouts. Marlene explained that Ellie was undergoing surgery. This is because the fungus in Ellie's body produces a chemical signal that makes ordinary fungi think they are kindred spirits and thus immune. The doctors plan to extract the fungus from Ellie's body and propagate the cells in a lab to create a cure for everyone. And the fungus grows in the brain, which means Ellie will die. Joel is so adamant that he's against it that he takes a step forward and is punched in the stomach by a soldier. Marlene understood Joel's feelings at that moment because she had been present when Ellie was born. Fifteen years ago, Ellie's mother, Anna, became the target of an infected individual. Anna, her water already broken and about to give birth, rushed back into the house, with the infected individual in pursuit. She barricaded herself in a room. Despite Anna's efforts to keep the infected at bay, they relentlessly pounded on the door. Soon, the door gave way, and the infected lunged at Anna. Anna fought desperately, eventually using a small knife to kill the infected. Anna managed to push the infected away with all her strength and simultaneously gave birth to Ellie. However, Anna had been bitten on the leg during the struggle. She quickly severed the umbilical cord. Unbeknownst to anyone, Ellie had already been infected by the fungus. Soon after, Marlene and her group arrived. Anna handed Ellie over to Marlene, emphasizing that Ellie was born before the infection took hold. Marlene assured Anna that she would take good care of Ellie. But now, driven by the necessity to save all of humanity, Marlene felt she had no other choice. She ordered soldiers to escort Joel out. On his way down the stairs, Joel backhanded the soldiers and quickly disposed of two of them, then rushed back to the rebel headquarters with a cache of ammo. Before Joel saw Ellie, he was like a god of war at the moment, literally killing God and Buddha. Anyone who stops Joel from saving Ellie must die. In the end, Joel single-handedly slaughtered the entire rebel headquarters. He found the operating room, where doctor attempted to stop him. Joel took care of the doctor with one shot. Ellie's nurse removed the four and cowered aside. Joel lifted Ellie and hurriedly left through the back door. In the underground garage, Marlene confronted him, pointing a gun at Joel. Marlene tried to reason with him. She believed Ellie, growing up in this brutal world, would eventually be killed by infected or marauders. Just because Ellie gave up on saving all of humanity, Marlene told Joel to hand over Ellie, and she wouldn't mind what Joel just did. Marlene lowered her gun when she thought Joel had agreed. Unexpectedly, Joel drew another hidden gun from his right hand and shot Marlene in the abdomen. Despite Marlene's pleas, Joel shot her through the head. The car headed north and eventually reached the vicinity of Tommy's settlement. There may not be a better place to live in this cruel world. Joel concealed the events at the rebel base from Ellie, instead telling her that they conducted some tests and discovered several people like her. Immune to the fungus, however, the doctors couldn't find a solution, and the search for a cure was abandoned. As Ellie looked at Joel, she asked him to swear that what he said was true. Perhaps Ellie sensed the kind lie, but the truth no longer mattered. Joel, like a father, remained by her side. 